Welcome to the Institute for Australian and Chinese Arts and Culture at Western Sydney University. My name is Jing Han. I'm the director of the Institute. As always, we want to acknowledge that Indigenous and Torres Strait Island people are the First Nations of this continent, and that the Institute is under the country of the Darug people of the Darug Nation, and acknowledge their ancestors who have been the traditional owners of their land for thousands of years. We also want to pay our respect to the First Nations elders, past, present, and emerging. Welcome to RAC Art Talks. So far, we have had six great lectures. Each lecture opens up a new world to us and our audiences. The great diversity for art topics is just fascinating and truly enriches us in our appreciation of art and the world. Today, we are about to hear another very interesting topic, Chinese art in Australian public collections, ranging from the Shang Dynasty through to the present, a topic that requires years of knowledge, expertise and authority. So we are greatly honoured to have the invited speaker, Jackie Menzies, OAM, to give today's lecture. A very brief introduction of Jackie first. Jackie was the head of Asian art at the Art Gallery of New South Wales for over 30 years, from 1980 to 2012. During that time, she was responsible for the acquisition and display of the gallery's Asian collections, as well as overseeing the installation of those collections in two new extensions to the Asian galleries, one in 1990, the other in 2003. She was the editor of the Asian Collection Handbook and Asian Collections. These two publications were produced to coincide with each new extension. Jackie has been involved in many Chinese art-related exhibitions in the New South Wales Art Gallery, including Celestial Silks, Chinese Religious and Court Textiles in 2004, Buddha, Radiant Awakening in 2001, The People's Progress, 20th century Chinese woodcuts in 1996, Imperial China, The Living Past in 1992, Contemporary Chinese painting from Guangdong in 1986, and Late Chinese Imperial Porcelain in 1980. In 2015, Jackie curated, inspired by Buddhism, Contemporary Asian Australian Artist at Nantia Institute, Wollonga. Presently, Jackie is the president of the Asian Arts Society of Australia, TASA. Well, I'm honoured to be a member of the management committee. Now, please welcome Jackie Menzies, OAM, to deliver today's lecture. Thank you very much, Jing, for that warm introduction. That was terrific. Sorry about muting myself. <laughs> so today I am talking on Chinese art in Australian public collections. So Australian public collections contain some fine examples of Chinese art, exemplifying the best of many artistic traditions, past and present. The term Chinese art embraces different media, communities and markets across time, leading to extraordinary depth and variety to collections. Fortunately now, much of it can be found on institutional websites, since even rare and exceptional pieces are often not on display in their home institution. When they are on show, they should be sought out, as at the moment at the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney, where the engaging exhibition, 1001 Remarkable Objects, contains several fine examples of Chinese art. In fact, this exhibition inspired me to structure my talk around a selection of remarkable objects, since it is impossible to present the scope of Chinese art in public institutions in one short talk. I have tried to select pieces or collections currently on display, and I will variously consider individual works of art, themed collections, individual philanthropists, directors, and curators. 
a few of the numerous players instrumental in the formation of public collections. I thought I would start with the work by Guan Wei, since he is important to this institute, being an adjunct fellow with an honorary doctorate and has contributed so much to the broader arts community. The idea of Guan Wei's work, which is his, in the National Gallery of Australia, and Guan Wei is represented in most public institutions, and one that applies to many of his works is the search for home for people around the world. The work includes several islands with different names, indicative of the fate that might await. For example, Calamity Island, Enchanted Island. Ideas of loss, grief and searching, together with issues of migration, identity, assimilation, and moving between different cultures are all embodied in this work, which like so much of his work, embodies current social and environmental dilemmas narrated gently with humour. So much Chinese art catered to export markets around the world. In the case of export porcelain for the Australian market, the most significant work is this punch bowl. It is a unique example of later Chinese export ware to the West, when from the 18th century, individualised porcelains for the table became the height of fashion in Europe and North America as a way of showing off wealth and status. Punch bowls were prestigious items within the repertoire, and this one was undoubtedly commissioned by a wealthy and prominent citizen of early Sydney, although we still do not know who. The bowl is one half of a harlequin pair with another similar but not exactly matching bowl in the collection of the National Maritime Museum in Sydney. They are the only two known pieces of Chinese export porcelain with panoramic views of Sydney as decoration. Both date to around 1820 and were decorated in Canton, Guangzhou. The bowl is currently on show in the State Library of Sydney, along with a contemporary Ding De Zhen copy commissioned by Horden House in Sydney. So there are in fact now three punch bowls. The decorative enamelling was produced by Chinese craftsmen copying the Sydney scenes from early published engravings. There was a possible source for the scene in the engraving after a lost original drawing showing on the right of your screen. The bowl's interior is decorated with a group of seven Aborigines holding clubs, shields and spears. In the upper left image, you can see the bowl bears an elaborate monogram that is all but invisible due to wear or deliberate erasure due to change of ownership. Deciphering this monogram may lead to a better understanding of where this punch bowl has been. Important in the story of early Chinese art collections in Australia is Englishman Bernard Hall, director of the National Gallery of Victoria, or NGV, from 1892 for 43 years. Born and educated in England in an affluent, well-educated, cultured circle, Hall brought high standards of aesthetic merit and craftsmanship to the Melbourne artistic community. The idea of the connoisseur of Chinese porcelains was one he absorbed in England, where his tastes were shaped by James McNeil Wister's enthusiasm for blue and white wares, although Chinese porcelain had been collected in the West, Middle East and India for centuries before then. The image entitled The Connoisseur in the Centre focuses on Chinese porcelain as a signifier of discernment. You can even see Hall has incorporated a six-character Ming Ma for the Chenghua period, Chenghua porcelain being regarded as one of the heights of technical and aesthetic achievement. Hall himself was a native, noted painter, and his enthusiasm for the inclusion of exotic Asian objects in the home is reflected in the painting on your left although inspection of the object shows the porcelains to be late Qing dynasty, not a high point of porcelain production, and Japanese bronzes, a popular area of collecting in Hall's day. Through Hall's enthusiasm, the trustees of the NGV adopted a policy to purchase oriental works of art, chiefly Chinese. It undoubtedly led to the formation of the present fine collection, and much credit must be given to Hall. After the acquisition of the substantial Felton bequest in 1904, which brought extraordinary wealth to the NGV, many important acquisitions were made. Hall himself actively pursued acquisitions through, through auctions in Sydney and overseas, as well as through leading international dealers in Chinese art. 
In June 1924, Hall wrote, To us the old Hun, Tang and Sung wares are some of the most beautiful and affected, affecting things in the whole range of art. Unquote. A notable acquisition made by Hall was the Ming wine jar, of which two jars appear on your right. Dating to the late 14th, early 15th century, it was acquired with Felton Bequest Funds in 1927 at an auction of Chinese art in Sydney from the collection of Dr. R. A. Fox, who had lived in China for 30 years. In fact, many pieces in public collections have come from the collections of individuals who lived in China for many years. The jar is decorated with a continuous landscape in the style of the Southern Song tradition of the Imperial Academy. So pictorial is the scene, it can be read right to left like a hand scroll, starting with the walking direction of the scholar, followed by an attendant. In terms of the continuous landscape decoration, the jar seems to be an isolated example, although beautifully painted. The base of the jar, which must have been looted on separately to the body, fell off, presumably during firing, and is still absent. Internationally, the name of China is synonymous with Suk, which the Chinese exported from the time of the Suk Road, as well as using themselves. Institutional holdings of Chinese robes, textiles, shoes, hair ornaments and other accessories in Australia are extensive, but I have selected this remarkable piece to show. The donor of this rare uncut robe, John Connell, whose wealth came from the hotel business in Melbourne, was one of the extraordinarily generous person who really enhanced the NGV holdings. When he offered his collection, a mixture across media and cultures, to the NGV, Hall selected 700 pieces for the collection. There is no public record of where and when Connell obtained this rare robe. As an imperial robe, its shape, design and colours were strictly regulated. Its typical design of nine dragons, the ninth is hidden on the inner flap of the robe, twirling in a celestial realm of clouds interspersed with auspicious symbols, is the reason such robes are popularly known as dragon robes. The robe is swimming in auspicious motives. They include the show character for longevity, bats holding the swash sticker, which is a rebus meaning, may you have the greatest joy, and coral, one of the precious objects symbolizing wealth and fortune. The mountain along the bottom border is a reference to the Isles of the Immortals in the Eastern Sea, another wish for longevity. Or was excited to receive notice of the 1921 bequest of George Chinese Morrison, who lived 1862 to 1920, traveler and journalist, the famous Peking correspondent of the Times from 1897 to 1912. But he was disappointed. In Leonard Cox's book on the National Gallery of Victoria, 1969, a wealth of information about the collection. Cox writes rather harshly, quote, the Morrison bequest was anticipated to be a splendid assemblage of the ancient treasures of the East, largely through the mystique associated with the name and reputation of this courageous and remarkable man. However, little of it was of exhibitable quality, according to the taste of the day, and later a good deal of it was sold." Unquote. The NGV still has some 30 objects from the Morrison bequest, a few hand scrolls, bronzes, but mainly ceramics. Admittedly, 19th century examples, perhaps late in terms of collector's benchmarks for quality, but still of quality. The bequest also included a formal court robe, a chow fu, which was published in Antonia Finane's 2007 book on changing clothes in China. It was Morrison's son, Alastair, born in Beijing in 1915, who spent much of his time in Asia and was married to Hedda Morrison, a German photographer, who turned out to be a major benefactor to the Powerhouse Museum. After Hedda's death in 1991, Alistair donated several significant collections to the museum, including his wife's photographic archive taken in China and Sarawak. He also donated personal papers, Chinese paper cups, Japanese netsuke, Indian, Nepali and Tibetan bronze figures, ceramics from North and Southeast Asia, and a rich library of books. While in China, he and Hedda had begun collecting from 1940 toggles they found 
in Beijing and later in Shanghai and Singapore. The collection they formed is recognised as one of the most significant toggle collections in the world and the last collection Alistair donated before his death in 2009. The collection is on show now at the Chow Chak Wing Museum, University of Sydney, curated by Min Jung Kim of the Pa House and Xu Xia Chen of the Chow Chak Wing Museum. Naturally, many toggles have auspicious meanings, as for example, the wooden toggle here on your right. It shows a well-carved grouping of plum blossom, bamboo and pine, the three friends of winter, symbolizing faithful companions who are loyal even in times of hardship. The three-legged toad, also known as money toad, represents a charm for prosperity. Toggles depicting boys were highly regarded as they represented the wish for many sons. The powerhouse's amber example is particularly warm and lively. Another major donor to the powerhouse was Christian Ra Thornett, who, like Connell in Melbourne, assembled a huge collection, although she did focus on East Asian art, giving the museum, amongst other things, collections of Chinese fans and Japanese sword guards. In the early decades of the 20th century, many fine pieces of Chinese art, imperial, religious, merchant, rural folk, were available and collected by individuals who later gave them to institutions. Thornet is an example par excellence of this practice. She was born into a high achieving, wealthy, philanthropic Sydney family who shared a passion for collecting. One of her brothers was Sir William Dixon, who bequeathed a significant collection of pictures and Australiana to the State Library of New South Wales, which named the Nick Dixon Gallery in his honour. Thornet gave the powerhouse hundreds of items, yet on her death in 1972, she still had extensive holdings. The remaining collection, comprising Chinese works of art, jade, embroideries, furs, jewellery, silverware, Persian carpets, glassware, porcelains, furniture and coins, took three days to auction, with the proceeds donated to charity. It was a very famous auction amongst collectors of Chinese art and artefacts in Sydney. These intricately carved Simon Lafco boxes are believed to have been in use at the court of the Chen Lung of Afri Emperor, and certainly a six-character Chen Lung mark is incised on each face. And these remarkable objects are on show now in the in the, in the exhibition, A Thousand and One Remarkable Objects at the Powerhouse Museum. They are tour de force of intricate design and carved lacquer. The lacquer boxes, the variety of materials used to carve it, the toggles we have just seen, all attest to the skill of the Chinese craftsmen. When one considers the admiration felt globally for Chinese porcelain, bronzes, silk, carvings in precious and semi-precious stone, for example, jade, and lacquer and other materials, many unique to Chinese craftsmanship, one can empathise with the words of the well-known artist A Xian, who works across all me media. As he explains, the area I've been stressing, the idea I've been stressing is to introduce ancient Chinese decorative motives and age-old craftsmanship onto realistic human form including the bust forms. Both the bust and realistic human form are from Western tradition. On the other hand, the age-old craftsmanship and decorative motives are deeply rooted in China. When we talk about either side, they are old with long heritage, but nothing new. Once we put them together, as combined, they become a contemporary and exciting new form of art creation." Unquote. Arshian admits that creation for his jade bust, which is in the centre down below, and now is on is on is kept on show in the Art Gallery in New South Wales Library. The inspiration for this piece were the Han Dynasty elaborate jade suits made from thousands of small dynasty, thousands of small, finely polished parks in the belief that jade can make a person immortal. The other media you can see there are porcelain, lacquer, and on the right is a Quasone figure. And this figure come on the right comes from his Human Human series and is Lotus number figure number one, 
It's currently on display in the Queensland Art Gallery until the 23rd of June 2024, so you may have a chance to see that. His other figures come from his um, The Human Human series and some of in different public collections. In 1938, Herbert Wade Kent presented a superb collection of 129 Chinese works of art to NGV, including ceramics dating from the Neolithic period to the 18th century. Kent, a Melbourneian, built his collection during the 30 years when he was working for the shipping firm of Butterfield and Swire in China and Japan. The early ceramics in his collection, particularly those of the Tang and Sung dynasties, reflected his taste for pure form and colour, which are the preferences of the Chinese connoisseur and scholar, as Kent came to appreciate in his years in China. The vase on your right, Kent's most prized possession, was kept until his death when it was given to NGV by his widow. Kent was determined to assist Australian taste to a better feeling for and a wider knowledge of Chinese art which he believed to be one of the greatest expressions of the human mind and imagination. After presenting his entire collection to the gallery, he became the first curator of Oriental art, a position he held in short, till shortly before his death in 1952. In the years following his gift, with Felton Bequest funds, he went to London where he was able to acquire more splendid pieces. It was an eminently suitable time to do so, for it was the golden age in Europe for collectors of Chinese art. Kent's collection was influential on Australian potters who emulated the forms and glazes in his collection. Examples are Harold Hewen and Alan Lowe, both of whom copied the Celadon glazes and forms they studied in the Kent collection. Both the NGV and the Art Gallery of New South Wales have excellent collections of the earthenware tomb figures or Ming Chi made to accompany the deceased into the next life. The enthusiasm for collecting Ming Chi started with Westerners, a Western one that can be traced back to Europeans whose companies had been invited by the Chinese government to create a network of railways throughout China in the early 20th century. When the railway gangs reached Xi'an and Luoyang, the twin capital cities of the Tang dynasty, they cut straight through the huge surrounding necropolis. In China, the traditional arbiters of taste preferred ancient bronzes, shades, Buddhist sculpture and painting, and Ming Chi, admittedly through their own inauspicious associations with death, were not considered worthy of collecting. This situation was changed with the arrival of foreigners who sent Ming Chi pieces back to Europe soon creating a fashion with Western knowledge of early China, pivoting from porcelain to archaeology. Less than th 10 years later, forgeries of Ming Chi were appearing on the market. While NGV has had several donors for its Ming Chi collections, the largest component of the New South Wales collection is a gift in 1962 from Sidney Cooper. Cooper formed his collection of about 100 items when he was living in Beijing from 1934 to 1940. Amongst the pieces Cooper donated, the graceful hum figure on the lower left, whose distinguished but humble demure suggests she represents a courtly attendant, is on show now in the Art Gallery in South Wales in the exhibition entitled Dick Barr's Clay Cup Jug, curated by ceramicist Jack Glenn Barclay. The elegant pair of court ladies in the centre are often identified as princesses, but are possibly dancers, whose elaborate high-waisted dress and high coiffures date the fact figures to the late 600s. Such ladies are rare in the Ming Chi repertoire, and only a few still exist. They are particularly fragile with all the details of their dress and head and hair arrangement. The camel on the right was a representation of the famous three-color sunset glaze synonymous with Tang Dynasty Ming Chi. The camel was a symbol of the successful trade along the Silk Road to Central Asia and beyond. And as a Ming Chi became a Ming Chi symbol, 
of the wealth of the deceased. In 1985, the National Gallery of Australia acquired 285 woodblock prints collected by Peter Townsend during the period of residence in China, 1941-51. to 51. To give a brief biography, Peter Townsend, who lived 1919-2006, to 2006, was a veteran sinologist, the valued friend of many a painter and sculptor, and a deft magazine editor and he was at the centre of the British art world during the 1970s and 80s. His first ambition had been to become a concert pianist. But he, developed a passion, he developed a passionate interest in China and went there to live for five years in Chinese industrial cooperatives and to mix with leaders of the Chinese revolution. His friend, Joanne Lai, gave Townsend his first contemporary woodcut, and this was the beginning of his magnificent collection of such prints. Zhou Enlai also arranged for Townsend to confer with Mao Zedong in 1946, and in 1955, Townsend published a book about Mao's revolution, China Phoenix. Back in London by 1959, he worked for London-based Chinese newspapers, then he met many more painters after he became editor of Studio International in 1966, a position he held until 1995. The NGA collection consists of woodcuts and wood engravings created during a period of great political, social and economic upheaval in China. The prints represent the renaissance of a traditional art form and all are available to be viewed on the web, the NGA web. Earlier this year, NGA organised a two-day workshop, Artists Look at Art, activating the Peter Townsend Collection at the National Gallery of Australia. With artists and academics here and in China, it is also available on the web and is worth watching as many artists and curators present during those turbulent years in China give their responses to the Times and the Prince. There are other notable collections of revolutionary prints and posters in public collections. The NGA has a group of prints dating to the 1970s, sold to them by different Chinese printing houses through the Australian Embassy in Beijing in 1978. And the collection of Stuart Fraser at La Trobe University in Melbourne comprises almost 4,000 posters from China, the USSR and Vietnam produced between the 1960s and 1980s. It is possibly the largest repository of Chinese propaganda posters outside of China, hailing from the period of the Cultural Revolution. By the 1970s, the increasing price and availability of the best of Chinese art, such as imperial porcelain, bronzes, jade and literati paintings, were well outside the budgets of most Australian collectors and even institutions. Amongst Australian collectors, there was a distinct shift in collecting Chinese art when it became popular to collect Chinese export ceramics discovered in Southeast Asia. This shift resulted from collectors spending more time in our region rather than trekking back to England in their hunt for ceramics and other treasures. In addition, there was the excitement of archaeological and maritime finds in Southeast Asia that were increasingly coming into the public arena from the 1960s and enabled the cheap acquisition of Chinese ceramics, dating back to as early as the Tang Dynasty. This interest in Chinese export wares to Southeast Asia were part of a wider recognition of the then little known ceramic traditions of Thailand, Cambodia and Vietnam as well. In addition, growing familiarity with the Chinese heritage of Southeast Asia generated acquisitions in other areas. For example, the textile collections of Australian institutions are rich in examples of textiles made for the Chinese and Puranakan communities of Southeast Asia. Puranakan culture was a fusion of the local Malay culture and that of the Chinese, who primarily came to trade in Malacca, beginning as early as the 15th century. In 1993, the NGA, which had focused its collecting on Southeast Asian textiles, mounted the exhibition Dragon and Phoenix, 
textiles of Southeast Asia's Chinese communities. Drawing on the fine collection of Malaysian Chinese costumes and accessories, established, assembled by Alice Smith in the late 1930s and 1940s when she lived in then British Malaya and donated to NGA by her children. Major areas of collecting Chinese export ceramics included Qing Bai wares and celebrities, particularly its large platters for communal dining. One of the notable collections of Qing Bai wares in Sydney was this, that of F.W. Boda, from whose collections the two examples here came. Unique to Qing Bai glazed wares of this trade was the use of overglazed iron brown spots. Iron spotting, which disappeared after the 1300s, is seen to its best effect on the rare and delightful model of boys in a lotus pond, with the innovative use of brown spots to accentuate the boy's hair. I think this piece is still on show in the Sydney Modern, in the uh, north wing of Sydney Modern at the Art Gallery, New South Wales. A major collector and donor of Southeast Asian ceramics and textiles in Sydney has been Chinese-born Australian paediatrician Dr John Yu, who served as CEO of the Royal Alexandra Hospital for Children in Sydney from 1979 until 1997, was Australian of the Year for 1996 and Chancellor of the University of New South Wales from 2000 to 2005. Accepting his Australian of the Year Award in 1996, this distinguished advocate of Chinese and Indonesian art said, I am proud of my Chinese heritage, but even prouder to, to be Australian. Yu was an avid collector who acquired his first Chinese ceramic in the early 1970s. The Changsha Bowl on show is one of many in Australian public collections gifted by donors who had acquired them in Indonesia from 1998 after fishermen found loose pieces from the famous Tang Dynasty Beilitung cargo wreck that was later formally excavated. The textile is part of a wedding balance and demonstrates the level of skill and artistry attained by Peranakan embroiderers in the 19th century. This valance would have been the horizontal part of a traditional wedding bed canopy. Intricately embroidered with silk and gilt thread, it is patterned with colourful birds and butterflies, and the decoration is auspicious, as it is the original red background. Masterpieces of the great Chinese literati style of painting were acquired by NGV under the curatorship of Dr. Mayanna Pang, Curator from 1972 until 2016. Peng was a student of the great painting expert James Kale at Berkeley, California, and was the first of his students to receive a PhD in Asian art in 1977. She used her expertise to great effect, obtaining some important Chinese paintings with the support of her directors. This group of four landscapes are by Bada Shan Ren which were obtained from New York collector and dealer C.C. Wong. It was once in the hands of a German dealer who separated the set and sold them individually, but C.C. Wong, Wong brought them back together. Zhu Da was a noted eccentric named the Mad Monk Painter, although Peng makes the point to that, quote, throughout Chinese history, madness was sometimes feigned in order to escape from danger as if playing the fool were the only means of survival, unquote. The collapse of the Ming dynasty and the turbulence of the early Qing dynasty when the Manchus seized power impacted Zhu Dao, who withdrew to the mountains and found political and spiritual refuge as a monk in a Chan Zen Buddhist monastery. In 1685, he adopted the name Bada Shan Ren. To paraphrase Pang, these paintings are inspired by his intimate relationship with nature and his knowledge of the four great masters of the Yuan dynasty, also a time of foreign oppression in, China, oppression. in Chinese thought, nature is a refuge and man is at one with his natural environment. Landscapes without human presence are permeated by the cosmic qi or vital force. 
In these landscapes, Judah does not imitate the appearance of nature and the styles of the ancient masters. He absorbs their essence and transforms it to express his own thoughts and feelings. The scrolls are like four movements within a piece of music, progressing right to left from a quiet to more tempestuous rhythm. Unquote. Another great advocate of Chinese painting was Edmund Capon, who was director at the Art Gallery of New South Wales from 1978 until 2011. An extraordinary energetic, erudite and enthusiastic advocate for Chinese art, his initiatives, such as purchases, donor support through financial donations and gifts, greatly enriched the collection. He was an advocate for Buddhism, acquiring early sculptures and paintings of the Shanghai School, as well as more contemporary painting. Here are two of his acquisitions. On your right is a votive steel dating to the Northern Wag dynasty of the 6th century. The front side of the stele is carved with the principal image of Shakyamuni, the historical Buddha, seated in a niche, while the reverse features a principal image of the future Buddha, Maitreya, sitting cross-legged. The Shakyamuni Buddha, Buddha sits beneath a flame-ornamented canopy and is flanked by a pair of bodhisattvas, those most human of beings in the vast pantheon of Buddha's deities, who, having achieved Buddhahood, elect to remain on earth out of compassion for others. The figure of Maitreya is also flanked by a pair of small bodhisattva images. Above both the principal images, the stele is carved with a field of miniature Buddhas. Further inscriptions on all sides of the stele give the names of donors who contributed to its construction as an act of Buddhist devotion and merit. On the left is a painting by Wong Chen, that's 1867 to 1938, called Nine Years Facing the Wall. And it was a hanging scroll purchased by the gallery in 1989. This endearing and robust image of the Buddhist deity Bodhisattva, the chief patriarch of the Chen, Chan or Zen Buddhism, reveals the imaginative and energetic combination of tradition and modernity in late 19th and early 20th century Chinese painting. According to legend, Bodhisattva achieved enlightenment after spending nine years staring at a blank wall. The artist is a noted exponent of the Shanghai School of Painting, an amateur art scholar artist who took to painting relatively late in life, having previously been a successful and wealthy Shanghai businessman. The title is part of Wong's poem on the left. In 2003, James Hay donated some 50 pairs of calligraphy scrolls to the Art Gallery in New South Wales. James had collected them from the 1970s while working for the British Civil Service in Hong Kong from 1956 until 1990 when he came to live in Australia. They were not expensive and many were obtained at the various premises he frequented in Hollywood Road in Hong Kong. As James Hayes himself wrote in the poetic Mandarin catalogue of his collection, quote, couplets such as these had become popular among scholars in the late Ming dynasty. It was an elegant literary form with prescribed rules that taxed the writer's poetic skills and his mastery of words and allusions. By the 18th century, the couplet was universally favored for recording friendship or esteem, commemorating birthdays, eulogizing the departed and marking many different occasions. The absorbing catalogue by Lu Yang, who was curator of Asian art at the Art Gallery of New South Wales, 1997 to 2011, and is now chair of Asian art at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, is rich in its detail and phrase for the couplets and their writers. The lines in the right poem are a compliment to a scholar for his outstanding knowledge and elegant writing style. The writers of both these examples were admired as eminent calligraphers of their time, as well as for holding responsible government positions. And this was the Kay's collection was then shown at the Art Gallery of New South Wales as well in early 2003 or 2004, together with the publication of the catalogue. While the Hayes Collection encapsulates the traditional Chinese respect for scholarship 
and the three perfections of painting, poetry, and calligraphy. During the years James was collecting, others who were in mainland China were collecting examples of the new wave of contemporary art that blossomed from the 1980s. And this included Dr. Jeff Raby, AO, economist, diplomat, and chair of the ACIAC Advisory Board. He acquired this collection over 30 years, from 1986, when he was first posted to Beijing as the first secretary, head of the economics division at the Australian Empathy Embassy, to his return as Australian ambassador from 2007 to 2011 and beyond. Raby immersed himself in the burgeoning Beijing art scene and actively sought out the work being created in the capital and throughout China. As Damien Smith wrote, quote, more than being a collector, Raby became an advocate of Chinese contemporary art. He encouraged others to buy, he facilitated exhibitions, and most importantly, he encouraged creative exchanges throughout Australia and China, unquote. In 2019, he devoted a collection of 170 works to La Trobe University under the Cultural Gifts Program. As the university web says, quote, the Jeff Raby Collection of Chinese Art surveys key aspects of contemporary art practice in China, dating back to the end of the Cultural Revolution in 1976. It comprises paintings, photography, works on paper, ceramics, sculpture, and textiles, by more than 70 artists and explores themes of social realism, political satire, humour, individual liberty, cultural exchange, traditionalism and nationalism. The collection is significant both as a contemporary art collection and as a resource for research and teaching." Unquote. And here we see Jeff Raby in the upper photograph alongside in front of paintings by Li Da Cheng and Ling Jian and on the right is a work by um, Guan Wei at the time of the Sydney Olympics. In 2023, Raby's collection went on view at Bendigo Art Gallery in our time from the Jeff Raby collection. It was held in conjunction with Treasures of Dai Gum Sun, Chinese artistry from the Golden Dragon Museum. The Golden Dragon Museum has a collection of over 30,000 objects relating to the Chinese in Australia and since its opening in 1991, it has won numerous tourism awards. The opening of the museum is another example of the growing appreciation for the Chinese heritage in Australia. The 1990s saw the start of serious collecting of contemporary Chinese art by public institutions, particularly with the stimulus provided by the first Asia Pacific Triennial or APT in Brisbane in 1993 and its subsequent reiterations. The first APT included the work of eight mainland Chinese artists, none of whose work was acquired for the permanent collection. The first actual exhibition of contemporary Chinese art in Australia was New Art from China in 1992, curated by Claire Roberts and held at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. It was the first time Xu Bing's work was shown in Australia and his book from the sky was subsequently shown at Queensland's Asia Pacific Triennial and acquired for their collection. It is a major work of Chinese art. As stated on the Quagmore Queensland Art Gallery and Museum of Modern Art website, Xu Bing belongs to the new wave of fine arts movement that since 1985 has seen the production of art which overtly denounces political oppression. A book from the sky has been vilified by the Chinese government, but has also been lauded as the definitive work of the new wave movement, receiving wide public attention in China and internationally. This vast installation, which is composed of reams of paper, drapes from the ceiling and covers the floor in the form of traditionally bound books. The paper is printed with thousands of characters. Paradoxically, all of the characters were invented by the artist. The primary process of printing, which is to spread knowledge, has been subverted. Interpreted in as an audacious and destabilizing political statement, this work infers the political dialogue, which is disseminated in print, is devoid of meaning. Unquote. While best known for explosive events, 
in which gunpowder and fireworks are used to create ritualistic spectacles. Sai Guo Chung, the artist of this work, has also created a number of elaborate installations throughout his career. They reflect his early training in theatre design and performance. Sai travelled China with a propaganda troupe during the Cultural Revolution era of the early 1970s and studied at the Shanghai Theatre Academy in the 1980s. There is an explanation of his work by Russell Storer on the GOMA website. Quote, this work was initially inspired by an image that came to the artist after travelling to North Stradbroke Island off the coast of Brisbane in 2011. The pristine environment of the work embodies Sai's perception of Queensland as a kind of last paradise, where the woes plaguing the rest of the human and natural worlds are yet to take hold. The allegory that heritage creates of a harmonious multicultural society within a unique and beautiful landscape is understood as an ideal, its tensions and fractures lying just below the surface. The only movement is a single drip of water that falls from, falls from the ceiling into the pool, its slight disturbance reminding us that this conviviality cannot last." Unquote. An important feature of the APT, initially an experiment with an unknown outcome, is the number of commissioned works which enter the museum's permanent collection. This has proven an excellent way to build the collection. They now have several works by the internationally fated master Ai Weiwei. And again, the Burma website explains this work. Since 2000, Ai Weiwei has sourced materials from the sites of demolished historical buildings, reusing timber pillars, beams, and doors to create monumental works such as Pillar Through Round Table. This work is part of an ongoing series employing traditional Chinese furniture, architectural elements, and building techniques, materials and skills fastly disappearing due to China's rapid, rapid economic and urban development. In these pieces, I investigates the point at which a mere piece of furniture becomes an object of artistic expression. I sculptures in this vein are strange, impractical forms, yet their seamless construction acknowledges the great craftsmanship of ancient China." Unquote. The craftsmanship I so admires is evident in the rare Australian example on your right. And this is box frame armchair, follows a traditional Chinese model, but is made from Australian timbers. According to tradition, it was made by a Chinese furniture maker during the 1850s near or en route to the Victorian goldfields. Many of the large numbers of Chinese who emigrated to Australia during the Victorian gold rushes of the 1850s and 60s stayed on and turned to cabinet making. This chair is included in Peter Gibson's recently published book on Australia's Chinese furniture factories, which is a substantial contribution to Australian Chinese studies. That brings me to the end of my images. It is very hard to make my selections, although, as mentioned, I was guided in part by what I know to be on show at the moment. I hope I've been able to give some idea of the nature and extent of Chinese art holdings in Australian public collections and inspired you to study more closely some of their remarkable holdings. Thank you. Thank you again, Jackie, and uh, thank you, audience. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>